broadcast that you're uh, watching right now is part of Stay at Home, a new series from Jackman where most days at 6 p.m. Eastern, we're talking to a left-wing thinker and then doing a Q&A. Um, for the Q&A, you should just log into YouTube and drop some questions in the comments section. Uh, then we'll we'll read them uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, our guest today is going to give a 25 a minute or so lecture, and then we'll have a quick Q&A. So why are we doing this? Well, obviously, socialist politics is built around mass rallies, strikes, door knocking, you know, all that other good stuff. But since we're practicing physical distancing, and some of those activities are going to be a little bit difficult for the next um, couple months, maybe, uh, though obviously we've been inspired by the examples of workers at uh, Whole Foods, at Amazon and Instacart and all sorts of other places in the last 24 hours that have done and walked out and, and other, other action. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this as a political education um, a series and hopefully these videos will have a long life uh, after the fact. Um, so tonight, before I introduce um, our, our guest, I just wanted to give a rundown of what's on. Um, yesterday, we had Karen Norevsky on why we demand public housing construction as, as socialists and why that demand, which is not on the agenda anywhere in the liberal um, center left in the United States needs to be on it for us as, as socialists. Um, and tomorrow we have Vijay Prashad on the rise of Modi and Hindu nationalism in India. Um, then the day after that on Thursday, um, also at 6 p.m., Tony Wood is talking about how shock therapy, the transition to capitalism, um, in, in Russia in the 1990s, really devastated the country, destroyed its industrial base, and gave us the conditions that created uh, Putin. Uh, then kind of the capping off our trilogy of bad uh, right-wing leaders, Sabrina Fernandez, uh, one of our contributing editors, who's based in Brazil, is going to be speaking Friday on how far-right leader uh, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil took, took over the country and the damage his administration has, has caused. Uh, then uh, for kind of a happier cap to the week, Matt Carp on Saturday is talking about how it took a mass movement to end U.S. Uh, slavery. So today uh, we're talking to Lee Phillips, who's a science writer at Jackman. He's writing a couple times a week for Jackman. You should check him out uh, there. And he's also co-author of The People's Republic of Walmart, uh, a really excellent book that makes the case for economic planning in the 21st century. You know, this is something that, that a lot of the left has been afraid to dive into. You know, we've been criticizing uh, neoliberalism, but we've been criticizing <coughs> capitalism, but Lee's book really goes further and makes a deep argument against um, uh, the market system um, entirely. Um, as I often kind of debate this topic with, with Lee, I'm more of a market socialist myself, but this was a really well done book and I, I recommend everyone, you know, check it out and grapple with it. Um, but today Lee's expanding one of the arguments that he made in Jack Ben way back at the end of January, early February, um, talking about why free market capitalism has made the response to pandemics like this current uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, that much harder and how free market capitalism has undermined everything from public um, health infrastructure as a whole. In the US, of course, we don't even have a single payer health insurance uh, to drug research. You know, what drugs are profitable for companies to, to invest in? What research is profitable to pursue and what research shouldn't be um, uh, uh, pursued if, if just following the logic of the profit model? <coughs> so, Lee today is, is on. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking for 25 uh, uh, minutes or so. Uh, please do uh, send your questions in uh, through the YouTube um, uh, channel. And um, I'll let Lee uh, take it over for, um, from here. Thanks a lot for, for taking the time, though, to talk to us. Cool, cool. Um, all right. First of all, um, I do have a bit of a cough. Um, I'm uh, hoping it's not uh, COVID. Um, so uh, if I cough during this, please uh, forgive me. Um, uh, straight out of the gate. Uh, so um, there are a lot of um, or a couple of um, pretty easy examples of how the free market isn't up to the coronavirus challenge that many of you probably will already uh, be thinking about, particularly in the United States. 
uh, where um, you you know private healthcare predominates, um, and that's simply because uh, just re specifically with respect to uh, COVID nineteen, uh, if you are uninsured or underinsured. Um, or you have, um, you know, recently been laid off, and so now you're uninsured. Um, uh, you are going to fear the cost of being te uh, tested, and uh, that fear will potentially, uh, if you are actually infected, you will continue to go on and uh, spread the disease. Similarly, um, the same lack of insurance or underinsurance uh, produces a fear of the cost of treatment which again creates an incentive for those who may be infected to continue to spread the disease. Um, then in addition, um, uh, if you, there is no uh, legal or union uh, established guaranteed paid sick leave, uh, which is very uncommon in the United States, but even in Canada uh, where, where I live, um, it's very uneven, uh, the guaranteed paid sick leave. So again, those who are infected will continue to work again, continuing to spread the disease. And this is, this is just something that is in the interest of the, uh, of, of, of the employer. Then in addition to this, what we can see is just within the market, we, we hear all these stories about profiteering, about individuals um, who will buy up a whole bunch of toilet paper, hand sanitizers, and then jack up the price and charge, um, you know, five bucks a roll or uh, 20 bucks for a um, uh, 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 hand sanitizer, but this is not just the case with individuals, and we all, you know, happily say that those that's uh, reprehensible what they're doing. Um, but also companies, uh, there are a number of examples where uh, companies that previously would have been charging um, uh, states, uh, you know, eighty cents for um, uh, for masks, are now charging four dollars a mask. Uh, so, and again, this is not something. It's not a matter of uh, the the company directors being evil. This is something that is um, inherent within the market system. Um, um, and you, uh, in addition to this, uh, the, it is in the interest of those companies to be distributing um, uh, their products, you know, PPE, personal um, uh, per uh, protective uh, equipment, uh, or uh, ventilators, whatever it happens to be. Uh, they'll be uh, distributing it to where to where it's profitable, not necessarily where it's needed. There may be some overlap, uh, but at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, the profitability. And again, they have they have no choice but to do this. It is not about them being evil. This is simply the market system. Um, uh, a good example would be recently that even uh, so, the Republican governor of South Dakota was complaining to uh, to Trump uh, about how. Um, because their, uh, their state is relatively small, uh, they are over and over again seeing uh, companies, uh, suppliers, uh, that they've signed contracts with just dropping these contracts. And she is furious that, uh, that this is happening. She wants uh, the state to intervene to force them uh, not to do this. So the, uh, the, the, the problem here is, or at least the resolution to the problem, even by some Republicans, is a non-market mechanism that is effectively the state intervening economic planning. And finally, even in those, those countries like Canada, like much of Western Europe, where we do have a public health care system, or rather where public health care dominates, because in some countries there is still alongside that public system uh, a private system, um, as a result of creeping privatization, neoliberal structural reforms, and above all funding cuts, uh, this has resulted uh, in a reduction in healthcare capacity. Um, and in many places, it's interesting now that um, almost overnight, uh, uh, many of those places where, that have seen this level of privatization or in the in introduction of internal markets into public systems like in the UK, um, those neoliberal actions are now being reversed. Um, um, because they simply do not deliver uh, according to need, but only according uh, to, to profit. Um, so those are some of the most obvious examples of how the free market isn't up to the uh, coronavirus challenge. Even conservatives are uh, immediately recognizing that, you know, there's, um, uh, uh, you know, the old saying that there's no atheists in foxholes. I think we might say that there are no neoliberals in foxholes, foxholes either. Um, that at the end of the day, uh, when the emergency comes, uh, the, uh, the, the market is simply too um, um, indifferent, too amoral, too, uh, too laggardly to respond to, to need. And so even conservatives will just you know, snap their hands 
and and uh, direct um, uh, production. Um, those are some, uh, you know, and we've seen uh, a raft of nationalizations in the last few days. Um, even Trump uh, invoking the uh, the Korean War era um, Defense Production Act, which which gives him enormous power to basically um, uh, direct supply chains. Um, this is the antithesis. This uh, this embrace of um, of economic planning of various descriptions of um, uh, the state coordinating production is the antithesis of 40 years of neoliberal um, uh, the neoliberal mantra that uh, the market knows best and the, the state uh, government public sector is inefficient compared to the market. What we find is actually um, um, in a you know wartime uh, like uh, emergency. Uh, they just don't have time uh, to wait for the market to respond. Um, these are some of the, the most obvious examples, but um, uh, and many of them uh, you, you'll be you'll have come across already. But one of the ones that I wrote about a few days ago, actually a few weeks ago uh, for Jacobin, uh, which people may not be so aware of, is how the market undermines um, um, research and development and ultimately deployment. Of, of research in a range of different areas within healthcare. And this basically comes down to uh, the very simply uh, the, the rationale of the market, which is that if something is beneficial, but it isn't profitable, or even if it isn't, in, even if it's insufficiently profitable, there is no incentive for it to be produced outside of some non-market mechanism. Conversely, if something is harmful, uh, but still profitable, then there continues to be an incentive for it to be produced. A uh, great example of that would be outside of the healthcare sort of situation would be fossil fuels. There continues to be uh, an incentive for fossil fuels to be produced so long as they're um, actors within the market. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, uh, perhaps um, the most well-known within the healthcare uh, sort of, um, uh, sector or sorry, um, uh, public health research would be the growing challenge of um, antibiotic resistance. So in the, um, in the last 30, 40 years, um, uh, major pharmaceutical companies have got out of the business of producing new classes of antibiotic and uh, to deal with bacterial infections. And uh, this is simply because um, the whole point of, a, of an antibiotic is that, uh, you know, if you have a bacterial infection, you will, uh, you'll take that drug, that antibiotic for, you know, uh, a couple of weeks. In the case of tuberculosis, a particular difficult, uh, which is caused uh, by a particularly, you know, um, difficult uh, uh, bacterium to, uh, to, to, uh, to tackle. Um, tuberculosis could take, you know, you could be, uh, you could have a course of many months. Of, of, of antibiotics. Nevertheless, even at that, that point, after a few weeks or a few months, if the drug is doing what it is supposed to do, you don't take that drug again. Um, so that sort of works against the way that um, uh, markets, uh, you know, commodities in the market uh, are supposed to, uh, supposed to work. The, the whole point is you want to sell as much as possible of a particular thing. So if in this case, the, the commodity works best the least that you sell it. Um, in addition to that, um, so, so, so responding to that, pharmaceutical companies, the reason they sort of got out of this uh, uh, was that they found that um, it, if you're going to spend, you know, about a billion dollars US per new molecular entity, effectively new sort of um, idea for a, um, for a new drug, if it costs about a billion dollars to, to, uh, to develop that, um, uh, you have a responsibility to your shareholders not to spend that money on items that have a very low return on investment or potentially no return on investment, such as antibiotics. Um, and it is much better to be spending that money on drugs for, um, uh, for, for diseases or uh, so illnesses uh, that are, are chronic, basically, you know, for, for uh, drugs that you would have to take every day for the rest of your life. There's a guaranteed uh, market there, it's continued um, expansion of the market. And, uh, you know, people will say, uh, you know, critics of, of the system sometimes will say, uh, um, you know, they would rather uh, develop an anti-baldness uh, remedy rather than antibiotics. But that's not really true. Um, um, AIDS uh, drugs are drugs uh, that people have to take every day for the rest of their lives. And so that's actually, ironically, something they're very happy uh, to do. Uh, so activists in the 1990s 
uh, AIDS activists um, found uh, once they had uh, surpassed the sort of a homophobic bigotry, uh, which was systemic at the time, that they were actually pushing at an open door, that this was a this was, you know, series of drugs for a chronic uh, illness. Uh, so that's actually a great profit opportunity for them. And this is the same problem of um, uh, markets being too small, uh, drugs for, for things, uh, for, for non-chronic diseases, for um, things that are basically a result uh, fairly quickly um, um, affects uh, not just antibiotics, but this is also true for um, antifungals. Uh, this affects vaccine research. This affects uh, disease monitoring. Disease monitoring is effectively something where there's very little profit, um, um, a decent return on investment there, yet deeply ne and necessary. Uh, even diagnostics, so tests, things like tests. Uh, again, there's challenges there. Um, now, in all of these cases, if they can see a, if they can see a profit, they will do it. But the problem is that the set of all things that are useful to humanity and the set of all things that are profitable, is, it, sorry, the set of all things that are profitable is much smaller set than the set of all things that are useful to humanity. In many respects, it's, it goes beyond the traditional uh, left-wing critique of capitalism that we might think or free markets that it's unjust. And now basically what we're saying, it doesn't produce enough. It's not innovative enough. Uh, that planning would be much more innovative. And now with respect to um, coronaviruses in, partic uh, in general and, and, and COVID-19 in particular. <coughs> so um, in January, there was an interesting article, an, inter an interview with, um, with structural biologist uh, Rolf Hilgenfeld in Nature, the, the science, uh, science journal, uh, who was traveling to, uh, to China. This was at the point, this was in January. So this was still at the point where this was not yet a global pandemic. And um, uh, he, um, one of the quotes in the, in the article, uh, Nature had actually taken this quote and placed it in their sort of daily uh, briefing as their sort of quote of the day because it was so, so spicy, so, so sort of like real, um, really piercing of the problem that we were facing. And he said, here's the quote, the total number of people infected uh, with coronaviruses if you combine SARS, which is also a coronavirus, and we'll talk about that in a second, if you combine SARS, MERS, and this new virus, which we now call um, COVID-19, is under 12,500 people. That's not a market. The number of cases is too small. Pharmaceutical companies are not interested. Um, now, uh, just very quickly, we should probably talk exact, uh, as briefly and simply as possible, uh, basically what coronaviruses are. Um, uh, COVID-19 is not the only cor uh, coronavirus. COVID-19 is a uh, coronavirus. It's a family of viruses that includes the SARS outbreak um, uh, from around 2003, 2004, uh, which hit um, parts of, um, of East Asia. Uh, MERS the, uh, is another coronavirus that uh, mainly affected the Middle East. Um, and actually about 15% of, of common colds are caused by coronaviruses as well. The vast majority of common colds are caused by another family of viruses, rhinoviruses, but about 15% are caused by coronaviruses. <laughs> so this is what Rolf Hilgenfeld is basically talking about here that um, uh, that all of the, this was until uh, this, the COVID-19 exploded. At that time, uh, the number of cases was simply too small. That's not enough of a market. Common cold, of course, affects uh, millions of people around the world, but it's so mild that, again, most people don't really worry about it. So there's really no um, uh, market uh, there either. It's insufficient for the scale of the cost it would, it would take to, uh, to, to engage in the research. Um, there's also a specificity to um, uh, coronaviruses. Uh, they have a high mutation rate because they're um, RNA viruses, which means that there's a lot less sort of proofreading um, of, 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 the, of the genetic code. Uh, so a lot more, there will be a lot more sort of mutations over time. So again, that means that it is much more expensive to be producing, to figure out um, uh, new therapeutics and or new vaccines um, um, every year or every couple of years. So those are the, so. There's also some specific challenges to coronaviruses. Um, 
but here's the interesting thing. So um, um, in the wake of the, so basically what I want to be arguing, and I'll, I'll try to give as much evidence in the next few minutes as possible, um, and then I'll wrap up. Um, um, going back to uh, the SARS outbreak, uh, this, cor this early uh, coronavirus, let's call it, um, you know, uh, COVID 1.0, um, you could, you could, maybe you could call it, uh, that was extremely um, uh, worrying. And public health officials, clinicians, um, epidemiologists, uh, and researchers at the time were very, very nervous because um, even though this one, we, uh, we managed to um, get, a, get a, uh, a hold on without it turning into a pandemic, it basically gave evidence that something at some point, a coronavirus of some description um, that was um, uh, particularly dangerous, dangerous would break out and, um, and, and threaten the, the world. And so in 2004, uh, the forum on the U.S. Forum on Microbial Threats, uh, which was previously called the Forum on Emerging Infections, and it was established in 1996 um, by the CDC and the National Institute, uh, Institutes of Health. They held a workshop in 2004 after the uh, SARS outbreak called "Learning from SARS: Preparing for the Next Disease Outbreak," uh, which was uh, which brought together all these sort of scholars, researchers, clinicians, public health officials to uh, to assess what do what do we get right, what do we get wrong. Um, ready for readying ourselves for for the next one, and in one in a section in this uh, there was a report uh, published uh, coming out of this uh, this workshop published by the National Institutes of, uh, uh, for, for Health, um, and in it there is a sort of series of key lessons, key learnings, and one of the, those key learnings um, said that uh, with respect to pharmaceutical access. Um, and I'll quote here, any forum to discuss international health cooperation almost certainly will include some criticism of U.S. positions in the WTO, in the World Trade Organization, on pharmaceutical sales, bad U.S. Um, research to develop tests, treatments, and vaccines is, under, is underway, but drug companies will have little incentive to bring such products to market without public sector support if SARS appears to fade away. Um, uh, this is crucial to understand. It's not that the research isn't happening on, uh, on these issues. Uh, it is uh, primary, but it's primarily um, being performed by public universities uh, or government research labs, which simply don't have the capacity or the funding to be able to develop, uh, to, to, to pay for clinical trials, and then ultimately down the road to actually um, uh, manufacture uh, uh, therapeutics, drugs, uh, 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 diagnostics, um, and vaccines. Um, and so there has to be some sort of incentive to those large pharmaceutical companies that do have the uh, capacity to do this. Uh, so that was as far, uh, it was as long ago as 2004. Uh, jump forward a few years uh, to 2013, and uh, Rolf Hilgenfeld, um, who I talked about a few minutes ago, who's an expert in this in this area. He and his colleague <coughs> Malik uh, Paris wrote an article in the Journal of Antiviral Research, a sort of review article looking at the, you know, 10 years of research, <coughs> excuse me, 10 years of research into highly pathogenic human co uh, coronaviruses from SARS to MERS. And um, so in um, the, the MERS outbreak, uh, which again, managed, we managed to uh, clamp down on, we managed to uh, prevent it turning into a pandemic, uh, had, had occurred just a few years bef before this uh, article came out in uh, uh, 2013. So 10 years now, they've had 10 years of knowing that this would be a problem. And they've, had, uh, they've lucked out twice. Um, uh, in this article, again, they, uh, uh, the two authors talk about the challenges to um, um, taking the research and, and developing this uh, to develop um, um, therapeutics, vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. Now, quote, there is no incentive to develop a SARS-CoV vaccine. Um, so we've had three, um, uh, three examples now of, of researchers themselves saying, um, you know, ringing the alarm, uh, saying we need, uh, the, the market is not working, uh, we need the public sector to step in 
So it's not me, you know, sort of uh, liberal lefty socialist um, saying Rawr, capitalism sucks. No, this is this is people on the front lines of the uh, of the of, of, of the problem. These are the researchers that focus on this issue. These are the people who are the, have the most expertise about this in the world. And they are saying the market doesn't work uh, for 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 uh, uh, for coronavirus research and drug discovery. Um, um, in 2016, um, in Nature Review's Drug Discovery, uh, that journal, um, uh, uh, another review article that looked at, now this was specifically looking at the, uh, the aspects of drug discovery and, ther and therapeutics. And um, again, twice in this article, the, the authors, um, I'll mispronounce the, the name, uh, Al Alamuddin uh, Zumla and his colleagues, um, um, argued that uh, the most important issue that they were facing, so I'll, I'll quote here, last and most important, the mild clinical severity of infections caused by, and he lists a, a series of the uh, various um, coronaviruses and the absence of new SARS cases, i.e. making insufficient size of, of a market, have made recruitment of patients into clinical trials difficult and reduced the incentives for pharmaceutical companies to develop specific antiviral drugs for these COVID infections. Over and over and over again, uh, we see um, researchers uh, making this, this argument. Um, and then finally, um, and in a textbook on um, disaster medicine, there was a section on emerging infectious diseases by um, a, um, a senior official with um, the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and whose name I, da, 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 is um, Shantini Gamage. She's the Associate Director of the National Infectious, sorry, it's not the CDC, sorry, the National Infectious Disease Service at the Veterans Health Administration, but again, somebody on uh, the front lines of, of, of public health. Uh, she wrote a, a chapter in this book on emerging infectious diseases and the challenges that they, uh, the spe specific challenges that they face. And she uses as, as her example, coronaviruses. And, um, and there's quite a bit that she says here, and if you'll excuse me, I'll, it's, it's worth um, um, exploring this at, at length. So initially she talks about anti, uh, the problem with um, antimicrobial drug discovery and moves on to a conversation about coronaviruses. She says, antimicrobial drug discovery waned in the 1960s when pharmaceutical companies turned their attention from the supposedly declining threat of infectious diseases to the more pressing and lucrative concerns of chronic illnesses. This is what I mentioned a few minutes ago. Despite an increasingly alarming understanding of the emergence and burden of antimicrobial resistant pathogens, the drive for the discovery of new drugs effective against bacteria and viruses has not been an industry priority. From 1998 to 2003, only nine new antibacterial drugs were approved. The same number as those approved for just one virus alone, HIV, in the same period. Remember what I said a few minutes ago about how HIV actually, uh, because of its, its chronic nature, is actually a, um, a, a lucrative um, um, uh, endeavor for, for, for pharmaceutical companies. Importantly, only two of the nine antibacterial drugs had novel mechanisms of action. So that's a bit of jargon there, that, but they, basically what she's saying there is that even where they have discovered new, um, a new antibacterial drugs, they're, for the most part, the firms are just engaging in copycat uh, research, tweaking existing, uh, tweaking existing uh, drugs. And um, this means that the, there is what she calls an innovation gap of novel antimicrobial agents. And uh, this has continued with only three new classes of antibiotics approved for use since 2000. She's writing in 2016, so just a, uh, three, three, four years ago. Um, uh, with respect to coronaviruses, she goes on to say that um, factoring in the high cost of drug development, the relatively low number of cases uh, initially, and the chance that, the, that an epidemic will end with no further cases, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies would be unlikely to even initiate the drug discovery process without government intervention and or incentives. And then she goes on to, to note how um, uh, realizing after 9-11, uh, the potential for um, uh, uh, the, the potential risk here 
um, that uh, the U.S. government developed a, um, a program called BioShield, which basically um, developed some new incentives for for um, for uh, drug companies to try to develop new um, uh, new protections, new um, antimicrobial um, and other uh, sort of drugs. Uh, but even here, even with this incentive, trying to make the market work, it still fell down because uh, the drug companies were um, uh, were were concerned about uh, potential liabilities uh, with respect to the fact that some of the incentives involved um, expediting um, the drug approval process. So now um, I don't want to spend the. I'm just going to wrap up here, but basically uh, saying that. Um, um, we responded to all of, all of this, the clinicians and even officials, senior, senior politicians, recognizing that the market isn't working, have developed <coughs> alongside this, a series of global um, responses, the global um, um, sort of funding agencies uh, to, uh, to incentivize or to fund uh, the manufacture of, 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 of uh, to, to, to fund drug discovery and even to fund the manufacture of, of, of doses. Um, but um, there's two things that we should say here. Um, uh, the, uh, the first is that uh, this, these series of global agencies, about three or four of them now, um, they are woefully underfunded because um, governments, uh, neoliberal governments are, are reluctant to fund um, them at the, the, the level that they require. Um, it's interesting that uh, Bill Gates, billionaire, has uh, long called for an increase in his own taxes. He's one of these, you know, liberal billionaires who said, no, please, please increase my taxes, but, uh, and called for the creation of a new robust um, agency uh, to fund um, uh, this sort of thing, um, uh, much more robust than the existing uh, networks and partnerships that have been created. Um, but then when push comes to shove, a few, uh, few weeks ago, he was, no, maybe I think it was a few months ago, he was um, on uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, the late night talk show and um, Colbert actually pushed him a little bit and said that, you know, um, how much would you be willing to see your taxes increase? Would you be willing to see a support uh, of, of something like a, a taxation of about 75% of uh, your income as briefly uh, existed in, in France? And he and his wife Melinda said, oh, whoa, whoa, steady on. That's, you know, that's, that's going a bit too far. Now, um, uh, France, um, other European countries that do have higher taxation rates than the United States, even these countries uh, that, you know, um, Gates and his wife think tax too much, even these countries are struggling to uh, meet their promises, their pledges to, um, uh, to deliver sufficient overseas development aid um, that they made um, as part of the sustainable de development, the UN sustainable development goals, and to um, contribute their promised one billion annually in climate finance to developing countries. So already those countries are struggling to to meet their those pledges, and now Bill Gates is asking for yet another thing, robustly many hundreds of billions of dollars in a new anti-pandemic uh, global agency. But he will not uh, countenance even the levels of taxation that exist in Western Europe. Um, so basically, he wants he wants socialism, but he doesn't want to uh, to, to pay for it there. So th that's that's the first sort of real challenge then that we we have to um, really scare that this is this is something whether in terms of taxation or the level of borrowing uh, that uh, um, uh, market actors really do not want to see the scale of, of taxation or borrowing that would be necessary to respond to the scale of the problem. And then finally, and I think this is just a uh, um, uh, this real sort of justice issue here. Why should it be the case um, that if uh, these new global agencies fill in the gaps uh, for where the market falls down, and they don't seem to be doing it very well so far because they're so insufficiently funded, why should the um, pharmaceutical companies make money uh, for the drugs that are profitable, while we, the taxpayer, the public sector, have to pay for the ones that are not profitable. What we should simply be doing is use the sort of principle behind a lot of national um, postal services, which is um, the profitable routes subsidize the less profitable routes, which means that to send a, a letter uh, from New York to Chicago doesn't cost much less to, uh, to send one to, uh, to Anchorage, Alaska. 
it, uh, even though the labor involved in transmission of that package to, to Alaska is much, is much greater. It's similar to here. What we should be doing is we should simply be taking uh, the pharmaceutical companies in, in their entirety into the public sector and uh, subsidize the non-profitable or insufficiently profitable parts of, of, of research, development, and, and distribution, manufacturing distribution, um, subsidize that by the, those, those chronic diseases, uh, the drugs for chronic diseases that are profitable. Um, and finally, this is uh, something that even if we do nationalize it, uh, this is uh, something that should not just be for US citizens only, or if it were Germany to do that, and Germany is actually at the moment discussing about nationalizing uh, sector, parts of the, uh, the pharmaceutical supply chain precisely in response to the coronavirus, uh, so the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, it must be for all the world. And again, not just for justice reasons, of course it is simply unfair if we discover a vaccine and we only give it to Americans or only to Germans. It is unfair if we do not deliver it to, uh, to uh, the, the millions of people in Sub-Saharan Afri Africa who may not be able to afford it. Um, but just from an epidemiological perspective, um, pathogens don't care who has and has not a US passport. So, we will continue in the developed world, we will continue to be um, threatened uh, by this virus if we don't make sure that everybody in the world, when we develop therapeutics, when we develop antivirals, and when we develop a vaccine, that we don't deliver it to everybody in the world who needs it, which means everybody in the world. Um, yeah, that's, um, I guess that's what I wanted to say. All right, well, thanks, uh, Lee. That was really, really good. And you ended on a positive note with a proper socialist programmatic uh, solution to the to the problem because that that's really the thing that separates uh, socialists from um, from our liberal peers and, and and others. You know, not just the the moral critique. The moral critique is necessary, but actually tying in a structural materialist, um, you know, uh, analysis and a programmatic conclusion. It sometimes can make our are, are writing stilted. I'm, I'm victim of this, uh, to this too, but in Lee's case, you know, he, he did it with a, with a degree of subtlety and expertise. So just a reminder for those uh, tuning in late, I see a bunch of people just, just joined, the, um, joined the stream. Uh, we've been listening to Lee Phillips, who's a science writer at Jacobin, um, and he's been talking about why the free market has struggled to deal with pandemics of coronavirus and, and the roots of this, uh, like for example, the way in which our drug research and development is incentivized um, in, in the private sector. And, and while we generate some additional uh, questions, um, you know, obviously you could leave some questions in the YouTube channel. Just as a reminder, uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, we'll be talking with Vijay Prashad about the rise of Modi and Hindu nationalism in, in India. And, uh, you know, this is something that you know, I was not prone to the hysteria about Modi in the lead up to his election because I saw the way Vajpayee and the BJP governments have, have governed in the past and said, this is going to be bad, but Congress is really bad too. And, you know, let's see, maybe he'll just govern in the interest of business interests and there'll be like a bad government, but nothing really bad. But, um, you know, I think it's been uh, about as uh, bad as, as people, you know, would have would have expected. Um, continuing on those happy notes, we have Tony Wood the next day on Thursday talking about um, the Russian transition to capitalism in the 1990s and the disaster, and shock therapy, uh, and extreme market reforms are, are, are you know, created there. And then on Friday, we have Sabrina Fernandez uh, talking about the situation in Brazil. And Sabrina is really, really engaging, and she, she is one of the best commentators um, in Brazil right now. She's one of the trivia editors, so you should definitely tune into that one. And um, and finally, the appeal for today, we, we, we you know, um, uh, are not asking for your, your, your money. You know, I know a lot of people lost their ships so dealing with a lot of other stuff. Uh, during this period, we're just asking you to press uh, subscribe, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is a prelude to a lot of great material. We're going to roll out at the end of the year. It's been slightly delayed uh, because of uh, coronavirus, but it's still, you know, happening. Uh, so please uh, press subscribe and, and you know, share these, <laughs> uh, you know, spread them around to your, uh, your, your friends. Um, you know, that's, that's the ask for now. It's a pretty, pretty uh, soft one. Um, so looking through, it looks like we, we have quite a few um, 
uh, questions. Uh, Lee, let me begin with a question from uh, Dan. I'll just read out what he, what he wrote verbatim. So the kind of economic planning that is needed in the US would seem to require a certain level of internal state capacity that 40 years of neoliberalism has made impossible. Does reconstructing the state need to come first? And if so, what are the first steps toward building the kind of state capacity that other developed countries, even countries like Japan and France and others, uh, can rely on? I think that's, hi Dan, that's, uh, thanks for the question. That's, that's really good and you make a really sound point. Um, uh, not just the United States, but across the Western world, we have seen uh, structural adjustment um, uh, neoliberal reforms really deteriorate the uh, deteriorate, sta deteriorate state capacity. Um, um, uh, at the same time, what I would say is that I I, I wouldn't want to argue that there's a sort of stages approach to this in the sense that uh, we have to deal with we have to reconstruct uh, state capacity and then we can begin to. Uh, engage in economic planning, some of which will engage, uh, some of which may be nationalization, other uh, parts of it may be just more shepherding of, of, uh, of, of, of particular sectors or having an industrial policy. Um, but um, I would say that you actually have to have these ideas of what you want to do in order to begin to, uh, to build, re, uh, rebuild that state capacity. You have to have these as a goal uh, along the way. And the second thing that I would be saying is that a lot of this is happening right now anyway, that the response to uh, COVID-19, we are seeing a sort of uh, disaster socialism as some commentators have, have described it. Uh, and I think that's quite accurate where there's a sort of like, ah, it's a, a mad rush to, to, to engage in economic planning by people who are unfamiliar with economic planning and industrial policy. And it is a bit of a mess. Um, I guess the, the 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 main thing that I would say is that I would love to see, and this is sorry, this is one of the arguments that me and uh, Michał Wysborski, my co-author of the People's Republic of Walmart book, um, um, the, one of the things that we wanted to make an argument or about, one of the reasons we wrote the book was that we really wanted to revive the capacity on the left, on the liberal left broadly as well, because it's not just um, um, socialists who can be making these arguments. Um, of uh, our capacity to make arguments around economic planning, industrial policy, uh, shepherding of markets. Um, I think a really wonderful book um, by Italian American economist who's, who's not a socialist, she's more of a social democrat or even a liberal, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, but certainly a Keynesian. She makes another very strong argument uh, in her book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, about uh, the role of the public sector in, 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 uh, in innovation that actually contrary to um, what we, the, the myth that we're told about how entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley, that's the locus of, of innovation. In fact, the vast majority of the, the technologies that exist, you know, the dozens so, or so technologies that exist in your phone come from the public sector. So I would say like, teach ourselves about this um, and uh, begin to make arguments around that. Okay, so um, uh, just as kind of a premature uh, plug, uh, Michal and, and Lee are working on a, a Kind of extended pamphlet now, uh, the People's Republic of Amazon that will uh, update a lot of the arguments in their their book, um, particularly to this to this moment where Amazon is uh, developing both terrifying economic and political power, but also you know creating um, advances in the fields of logistics and whatnot that we could easily imagine um, appropriating towards uh, the cause of human need. Uh, and not just lining uh, Bezos' um, um, pockets. Um, so there's an exchange that I'll, I'll kind of break down that I, I think is an interesting second question. So at first, Haley Burns um, asks a, a question, uh, which was that, you know, libertarians and others often say that other countries, you know, she's also a Canadian, uh, benefit from US private sector drug research, even <coughs> if it's bad at vaccines and, and whatever else. So I guess her question is, uh, can we actually, in fact, nationalize the entire industry? And uh, she asked this before you got to this part of your talk, but what incentive structure will we need to create? Uh, is it just state-funded research and prize funding? Um, and then someone, uh, Daryl, replied in the comments, um, I guess in relation to this question, uh, scientists are happy to operate outside of the profit motive, its reputation, uh, published research, et cetera, for them 
Uh, the problem is routine stuff, clinical trials, mass production, et cetera, I guess funding that. And he wanted your thoughts to see whether you agreed on, on that. Okay. What was his name again? Oh, okay. Anyway, so um, um, can we now, so Haley's question there. Um, so uh, you, there's a great deal of um, private sector drug research done in the United States. Can we nationalize the entire industry? Um, if I'm going where I think she's going with this one, I think, you know, this is a really, this is a really good, um, good question that we have to uh, have to ask. If we're now nationalizing uh, the, the, the drugs uh, sector or at least large parts of it in the United States, what does that mean for other, other countries? Maybe Germany might do the same, maybe Britain, two other countries that have very, very large um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical sectors. Um, we're nationalizing in the, uh, in the purpose of, of human need. But human need doesn't end the, the 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 border. So we would have actually have to have a real uh, conversation about how do we structure that uh, to deliver those uh, those goods to whoever internationally needs them. Um, is it the responsibility of the U.S. taxpayer to fund that? Um, I, I, those are those are very good questions. But uh, so I, I would say that nationalization is not enough. It, it, we also have to have conversations about how. You know, the way that the left has long talked about um, internationalism, but we often think about that in a very sort of abstract way. It's in our hymn, the internationality, but, and we talk about it in terms of solidarity with people fighting against um, occupation um, or, or war. But we also, I think, increasingly now, really need to be thinking very consciously about what structures of global, uh, global governance of these sorts of issues are necessary. And um, if we are going to go for those sort of global structures, let's make sure that they're genuinely democratic and not technocratic the way that sort of the European Union's um, uh, hollowing out of democratic accountability uh, is, or sort of the WTO or the IMF, and really have genuine um, sort of um, global democratic accountability of those structures. Um, in response to the second question, about scientists who are happy to work outside the, um, the uh, outside of marketing centers. Certainly, that's always been my experience, with a handful of exceptions. Um, most people um, um, are attracted to science because they love science, and so long as they earned a, a decent middle class income, would be more than happy to do that for the rest of their lives. That's why they're doing it. So I think it's you know, science is for for me has always been one of those examples of uh, of the the argument against the 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 the, the libertarian argument that. You know, if you don't pay, pay, uh, if you don't without money, how do you incentivize people? Actually, um, research it, it shows that uh, for the most part, um, so long as your 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 needs are taken care of, um, it's its own incentive. Uh, so I, I fully agree with um, um, whoever said that. But absolutely, um, the the real question there is going beyond what scientists do, but also the. Um, uh, the, the clinical trials and ultimately even, you know, manufacturing of, of the, the drugs themselves. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, there's uh, two more um, uh, uh, questions and I'll give it to you um, at, at, at once. And I guess we'll probably wrap up after, after this one. Um, so there's a question that, that asks about the relationship between um, agricultural uh, practices and you know, particularly, I guess, practices around livestock um, as a factor increasing the uh, pandemics arising from novel um, zoonotic diseases. So uh, to what extent kind of uh, can we pin at least some of this on um, how we're um, handling livestock and, and those conditions. Right. Um, and then a question from Scott, which is um, about, um, you know, a political movement, uh, how do we build a political movement that both challenges capital and recruits scientists alongside uh, the working class? So I guess this is just about the agency of uh, scientists to the extent uh, you see them as, as agents that we should be recruiting and can make a, a push for these, these demands. I certainly agree with you that they're not, um, you know, the, the enemy. Um, but I think that even though they could probably accommodate themselves to a different sort of order, I'm not sure they're going to be at the uh, vanguard if they're already earning, you know, six figures and 
you know, getting the research money for now, you know, from a mix of so sources to do what they want to do. But uh, I'll, I'll leave those two questions to uh, to you to, to uh, wrap up. Um, okay, uh, first, very quickly, uh, how to recruit scientists to the left. Um, it's and not just, you know, uh, to, to uh, um, the working class. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was a survey done by, I think it was the Pew Tra Charitable Trust on um, uh, the, the politics of, of scientists. And what they found was that uh, there, of all the breakdowns that you could have, all the demographic breakdowns you could have in the United States, so they, and they, inter they, they, inter they did a survey of um, all the members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the largest uh, scientific uh, body in the world. I don't think actually they managed to get all, um, uh, however many thousands, tens of thousands of members they have, but a, a size of, you know, a, a decent representative sample. Um, um, and what they found was the, 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 the sheer volume or percentage of people who are scientists um, who consider themselves not just liberal, but left wing, outstripped all other sort of demographics that they could think of that are traditionally thought of as, you know, more liberal minded or, or left wing. So um, there is a greater proportion of scientists who consider themselves to be left wing or liberal than union households, than LGBT, um, uh, you name it. Um, so actually, I think we're doing pretty well already on that front. Then finally, on the question of agricultural practices and the contribution there are to um, uh, pandemics. So there is, um, I, I do know that there are some figures who, who make this claim. Um, I, what I would rather emphasize is the role of deforestation rather than um, agriculture, uh, livestock uh, per se. We can see um, uh, particularly with respect to this, uh, this outbreak, uh, there is a, uh, this, it seems to be the case that it was um, the uh, trace back to a, uh, to the illegal import of uh, pangolin uh, from, um, from Southeast Asia uh, into China um, uh, for you know, wealthy um, families who purchase, you know, um, exotic uh, meats. So, there's certainly a critique that we can have there about uh, about those those sort of systems, um, but I am a, I'm one of these people who ha I'm a little bit more reluctant to blame livestock um, agriculture in its entirety. Um, uh, the congregation of uh, the congregation of animals um, in enormous quantities certainly does contribute to um, uh, to. Uh, to the challenge, but then so does the congregation of people in cities. So does um, uh, globalization. So does international trade, and we certainly want don't want to uh, do away with that. Any of those, um, and I would say that the there are a number of mechanisms that we can impose upon livestock agriculture, uh, technological changes that um, in many cases can be quite expensive, especially with respect to. Um, uh, ventilation uh, systems, um, very um, very rigorous ventilation systems um, that uh, large large um, agribusiness firms are very reluctant to embrace because of the additional costs. So, the, so the, again, the market is the problem there, um, not livestock, um, not, not animal husbandry itself. It's the market that's the problem, not animals. Now, one can have a question about whether one should eat meat or not, I eat meat, um, but I think that's an ethical question outside of um, um, uh, sort of pandemics. I probably should have noted, noted this um, uh, earlier, but um, you know, the first issue of Monthly Review, uh, May 1949, uh, had Albert Einstein uh, in it you know, making his case why I'm a socialist. So if we went over Albert Einstein, you know, I'm sure uh, we can win over uh, others. But uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you to Lee Phillips. Uh, check out his work in Jacobin. And I also should have plugged this earlier, but Lee is working with us on a coronavirus issue um, of Jacobin, which we're finishing up in the next couple of weeks and should be in your hands in early May. And tomorrow uh, we have Vijay Prashad on the rise of Modi and Hindu nationalism in India. 
So uh, thanks again uh, to Lee. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and please uh, press subscribe and you know share this video. It'll exist on the internet forever or until we get sued or delete it. I don't know, we didn't use any copyrighted material. So basically forever until the, until the YouTube, the Google servers uh, crash. Thank you.